Sol David, Mr. Zulu War, welcome. Uh, why did Britain find itself fighting the Zulus in the 1870s? Good question, because officially the British government had no intention of fighting the Zulus. And the, the, the time, timing is important. 1879, towards the end of 18, sorry, towards the end of 1878, early 1879, which is where most of the tension in South Africa that leads to the start of the war is building up. And the pro-consul in South Africa is warning the British government that there may be trouble ahead. British government, and meanwhile, is saying to him, whatever you do, we don't want a war in South Africa. Why? Because they're already fighting one in Afghanistan, which has broken out. And, and frankly, the Afghanistan war, which, of course, was fought chiefly to prevent Russian influence there, is, as far as we're concerned, uh, in strategic terms, far more important. So this relatively minor war against a warlike nation, but a nation that we didn't really see as a serious threat to us strategically in Southern Africa was something the British government wanted to avoid. So you might ask the question, why did we fight it? Well, we fought it because the pro-consul out there, a man called Sir Bartle Frere, had been sent to South Africa with one job, which is to confederate the various British colonies that existed there, Natal and Cape Province, but also the Boer republics, if he could, and they were going through the process of attempting to take over those Boer republics, but also any uh, native, any African, black African polities that might get in the way. Now, this didn't specifically mean that Zululand had to be taken over, but they had to be wary that it could cause a problem. Uh, but the exact timing, as I've already explained, was, was one that the British government were not uh, interested in fighting a war there because they were already fighting in Afghanistan. But Bartle Frere had other uh, intentions. And the reason he was able to get away with uh, making his own decisions is because of this time gap that you had in the late 19th century between uh, information coming from London and getting to South Africa. Three, four week journey for messages to get there. Uh, even by steamship. There was a telegraph part of the way, but it didn't go the whole way. So he was able to use this time gap really to ignore official instructions and to effectively launch uh, a war of aggression against the Zulus. And talk to me, the Zulus have been sort of mythologized as uh, this sort of incredibly martial empire. Uh, how, how much of that is true? What was the nature of, kind of Zulu society? It was very militarized. A lot of it is true. They, they, they've been described as the Black Spartans, and I think that's, that's pretty accurate, actually. Um, it's interesting that the original Zulu tribe was only relatively small size towards the end of the 18th century. And uh, I suppose, as a lot of people know, the, 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 the key figure in the rise of the Zulu nation, which was really a question of dominating the tribes around them and subsuming them into this greater uh, uh, Zulu empire, I suppose you would call it, was Shaka one of the early kings. Uh, and what he did is develop a new military system uh, which, which completely revolutionized warfare in Southern Africa. Prior to, prior to Shaka taking uh, control of the Zulu nation, tribes would often fight each other in Southern Africa, but rarely to the death, as it were. They would make a bit of a show. One or two people might be killed. One side would give in and the other side would take over. You'd take a few captives. But it was, I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating it a little bit, but it was relatively benign. This, this war of destruction uh, that the Zulus became very adept at was the, uh, was the brainchild of Shaka. And he created a new method of fighting, uh, not only new weapons, the short stabbing spear, the Asagai, um, Ikla, Ikwa, as it was known, very bad pronunciation, I'm sure. Uh, but to use this short stabbing spear, you had to close with the enemy. And so he devised tactics, the so-called horns of the buffalo, in which you would surround your enemy and annihilate them. Not unlike, interestingly enough, the tactics of, of the Roman legions. And it's quite interesting, when I was working on my Zulu book, I thought to myself, could there be any link between what the Romans had used and the, and the Zulus. And, and clearly, it, it's hard to see one. And yet the tactics are so similar from literally down to the throwing of the spears at the beginning of the battle in the same way that the, the uh, Romans would fire their, throw their javelins to closing uh, and using the, the short implement to annihilate the opponent. And that's pretty much what the Zulus became very good at. And as a result, they took over an enormous swathe of southern southeast Africa. And, and what, in terms of their development as, as a state, are, are, they in, are they in danger of competing with uh, the European polities down there? 
Well, that was the perception. Interestingly enough, up until 1879, they'd pretty much been, uh, you know, peace with the Zulus. That wasn't to say that the Zulus were peaceful among themselves and other tribes in the region, but it was to say that they recognised that the British were a, a, an existential threat and they'd better keep on their, on their side. So, yes, there were one or two border incursions which were exaggerated and used for benefit of the of the British to for, to to justify I suppose the the um, the war but I probably if we're being if we're being honest you'd have to say was it likely that uh, even a confederation of southern Africa would have put up with such a dangerous uh, organized military force on it right on its border probably not in the long term but the decision to deal with the problem in 1879 when the Zulus had no intention of going to war with the British was the decision taken by Basel Frere alone. So the war of aggression begins, a British force moves in a little bit, little bit arrogant? Very arrogant. Um, <laughs> arrogance, underestimation of the enemy, uh, poor reconnaissance, an unwillingness to take, you know, even minor precautions. So what lies behind all of this? Well, very much a, a feeling that we had the edge over them in terms of technology, which was true. We had some very good firearms, um, breech loading firearms at that time. But it's also a numbers game and we weren't going to put anything like the same number of troops in the field. So our best hope of defeating the Zulus was by getting them to fight on our terms. Lord Chelmsford, the British commander, makes one big mistake. He's fought a war just a year earlier against the Cape Frontier tribes. And it was really a question of trying to find these guys because they played ambush and run tactics and it was really difficult to pin them down for some reason and it's hard to know what that reason was Dan because he had a lot of intelligence from people who knew how the Zulus fought and explained to him what they were going to do he thought it was going to be similar in Zululand it's a question of finding them and bringing them to to battle not a question of making sure we don't get taken by surprise and so when Chelmsford with the central column. They, his plan is to invade um, by multiple different directions. But he originally thinks there are going to be five columns. In reality, only three cross the border. The plan is for all those three columns to meet at Alundi, the Zulu capital. And Chelmsford is pretty confident that the Zulus are not going to take on any of these columns before then. Why? We'll never know because uh, Zulu tactics are aggressive. They can march an awful long distance in a relatively short period of time. They can go from one bit of the country to another and, and, and take you by surprise in very short order. And why Chelmsford had managed to convince himself um, that they won't fight and we need to winkle them out, um, we'll never know for sure. But that undoubtedly, that was his conviction. And so not only did he invade with an inadequate force of about 5,000 soldiers in his central column, he then makes the double mistake of splitting it and marching off with part of it on a wild goose chase uh, based on some very faulty intelligence to try and track the Zulus down. Meanwhile, the Zulus are in a completely different place. That is the main Zulu MP, the main Zulu army. And it's got its eyes on the camp he's left behind with about 1,700 soldiers defending it at Islamwana. So we get the first cataclysmic battle of the war on the 22nd of January, 1879, just 11 days after Chelmsford's crossed the border. And it's one of the great defeats in, in British, but also European colonial history. Yeah, uh, you know, we could think of three or four that might compare the retreat from Kabul in 1842, uh, the Battle of May Wand in Afghanistan, which, is taken, take, which will take place a year later. Uh, Adoa, I suppose, uh, the Italians against the Ethiopians towards the end of the century, and Islam won. And that's it. This is a cataclysmic defeat because it was unexpected, because the Zulus take no prisoners and pretty much everyone they caught in that camp is butchered uh, because of the way they open the belly so that the ritual disembowelment of their enemies, which was for spiritual reasons rather than uh, an atrocity per se. But nevertheless, you can imagine when you come across a battlefield in which people have been butchered in that way. It's a pretty horrific sight, albeit it took the, the British almost two or three months to get back to the battlefield. So terrified were they. And Chelmsford is quaking in his boots after this battle for two reasons. One, because he suddenly realises the Zulus are a serious proposition. And two, because he's terrified he's going to lose his job. Is it a night attack? They make on the British camp. It's very early in the morning. So they, they've hidden in a valley about four or five miles away um, the night before. 
They're waiting there. 20, can you imagine the discipline? 20,000 Zulu warriors hiding in this valley, this hidden valley. Now, if, if Chance would have done his job, he'd have had scouts out all over the place and they would have, they would have noticed this, but he didn't. Overconfidence. They had pickets out around the, the, the camp itself at Isamwana, but not that far away. There'd been some very dubious scouting uh, done. As I've already mentioned, he, he was given faulty intelligence. So while that MP is hiding in that and, and uh, um, staying overnight in that valley, he actually leaves the camp that same night going on this wild goose chase. He's already sent out an initial force. He's told that that initial force has engaged some Zulus. Actually, it was only a relatively small force of Zulus. Um, to this day, we're not certain, the historians aren't certain, whether or not this was a deliberate uh, fake by the Zulus. Uh, a lot of people believe it was. It might have been. The sources are a little scanty on this. But what is not in doubt is that uh, they managed to divide not only once but twice this army so that, as I've already said, 1,700 soldiers are waiting in the camp. And what's significant about those 1,700 soldiers is about 1,000 of them are British troops and the other 700 are a mixture of colonial troops and African auxiliaries. And some of the latter uh, do not put up the toughest fight. Probably not surprisingly, actually, because they're very poorly armed and they're up against their mortal enemies who are in enormous numbers. And so the, it's, it, it's a battle, but I mean, it's, it's pretty quick, is it? It's a... Well, I actually, no, there, are, there is a moment during the battle where they, they almost hold out. I think the key to the battle is the uh, fact that the British send out their defensive position too far away from the camp. What they should have done is lagered the camp, use the wagons they had. They had enormous numbers of wagons there. They should have lagered and used that as a, as, a, as a fortress. But of course, they're taken by surprise. They don't expect the attack. The attack can, takes them completely by surprise. Uh, and by that time, an this is the interest, other interesting thing about the battle. The tactics they use for the battle are tactics which have been prescribed by Chelmsford at the beginning of the war, which is that you're, you're to send your infantry a certain distance away from wherever your, your lager is, uh, and, and you're to use the native auxiliaries and the, and the mounted troops on the flanks. And that's exactly what they do. But the problem is, such as the sheer numbers of Zulus, not only encroaching and for driving this force closer and closer to the camp, but also finally the horns of the buffalo meet behind, and therefore it's entirely encircled. And, but the Zulus are not using firearms. They have some firearms, uh, not very effective. Their method is really to fire them once and throw them away. What's interesting is the follow-up battle, which takes place that same day at Rourke's Drift. By that point, they've got a lot of the firearms off the British who they've killed. They kill almost all 1,000 uh, British soldiers uh, at Islam Wana to a man and take their weapons. And some of those Martini Henry um, breech loading rifles are used by the Zulus at Rourke's Drift. You mentioned Rourke's Drift. You protect, irrelevant skirmish or, or great moment of imperial apotheosis? A little bit of both, but definitely more of the former. Um, Rourke's Drift was very handy for Chelmsford and the British government and the Queen and anyone in authority back in Britain to uh, diminish the impact of Islam Wana. So you've got on the one hand this appalling disaster. Uh, you've got on the other hand this heroic last stand. Uh, which one are we going to hear more about? Obviously the second one, because by bigging up the second one, you somehow allow the, the consequences of the former battle, which should have been serious, not only for Chelmsford, who should have been sacked immediately, so incompetent had he been, but also arguably for the British government too, back in back home, that arguably would have fallen if it hadn't been for Rourke's Drift. So Rourke's Drift is tremendously important. Um, Chelmsford knows this immediately, and, and he's, he's writing reports exaggerating the significance of Rourke's Drift. Rourke's Drift has saved Natal. That was the argument. Complete nonsense. Um, the Zulu king, Chichwayo, had given his impies orders not to cross into Natal for the very good reason that he knew this would be, there would be serious consequences as a result of this. Natal was never in danger, but the, the uh, impie commander, uh, who was actually commanding the... Uh, the force at Islamwana that doesn't actually fight. So this is the reserve at Islamwana. He wants to get on on the action. He's seen the destruction of the British army at Islamwana and he wants, a, he wants a piece of the action himself. He's told that there's this storehouse at Rourke's Drift. Okay, it's across the Buffalo River, but only a few yards. There was never a danger to Natal proper. They want to capture this supply station, basically, 
uh, and take away some booty. Uh, so it's really a relatively insignificant skirmish. That doesn't diminish the extraordinary heroism of all the people involved. I mean, they were really up against it. About 140 soldiers at Rourke's Drift, about 25 of them wounded. So you've only got just over 100 fit soldiers against 4,000, three to 4,000 Zulu warriors. But unlike Isamwana, they are in a very effective defensive position, which they've had time to construct because word has come back to them from some of the few survivors at Isamwana that Isamwana has fallen and the Zulus might be on their way. You mentioned the British government falling. I mean, it's, it was a remarkable time in the 9th century because you had these crumbling imperial frontiers with people like Chelmsford sort of taking it upon themselves to invade its territory. And then the government in London dealing with the consequences, massive political fallout potentially, and, and you know, governments falling as a result of this. Yes, and the, and the context of the 19th century uh, in terms of imperial escapades uh, needs to be understood, which is that generally speaking, British governments did not like wars of aggression. They didn't even want to take extra territory for most of the century. What was generally going on is what was the same thing that was happening in South Africa for the Zulu War, which is that local proconsuls uh, and generals were, were making decisions on their own because they wanted military glory, because they wanted to, because they had a security problem they wanted to solve or perceived a security problem. It was very rarely policy at the center that was encouraging these imperial escapades. So you could argue that for Disraeli's government to have fallen in 1879 would have been pretty unfair considering it didn't want the war in the first place. But nevertheless, the war had been fought in its name and it had been fought incredibly badly. And then you've got honors then, of course, the British flag has been disrespected, so you've got to go and make amends. Yeah, and Chelmsford's was interesting because he's he's effectively protected by the Queen. He's a former aide de camp to Queen Victoria, and she insists that he stays in command for long enough to redeem his honour. And he does that by, by pretty much disobeying orders because a replacement is eventually sent out, Woolsey, who's one of the great uh, British soldiers of the 19th century. Woolsey's def desperate to get in, in on the action before it's over and Chelmsford is desperate to end it before Woolsey arrives. And he manages that by fighting a, a pretty one-sided battle at Alundi, um, which is just outside the Zulu capital, in which he's created a, a defensive formation, learned all the lessons from Islamwana, and it's a pretty much a bloodbath, a one-sided battle. So he somehow redeems his honor, but certainly not in my eyes. But even, even as late as me researching and writing this book, you will see a lot of differing accounts about Chelmsford's responsibility uh, and whether or not he got his just desserts. And I certainly don't think he did because he came back, he was, he was promoted, he was given various honors. He was uh, made Lieutenant Governor of the Tower of London and he died playing billiards in his club um, at the age of 78 in 1905. You know, none the worse really with his reputation. Lucky man. Um, what what about the Zulus? Is, is, how hard is it to hear their voice? It is quite tricky, actually. Um, a lot of the main players died in the war. The there was no, uh, of course, tradition of written uh, record in the Zulu culture. It was all oral. But nevertheless, we do have a lot of accounts from some of the Zulus who did survive and fought in the war that were then later on written down by Europeans. This is always a tricky uh, process for a historian to have to decide how accurate they are. Are they telling people what they want to hear? Despite all of that, when you cross-reference what was going on and who was doing what to whom, you, you, you can conclude that there are a number of good accounts. There are a number of first-hand accounts of senior Zulu commanders during the Battle of uh, Islamwana in particular, but also Rourke's Drift and the other battles. And so we do get a little bit of a sense of what the Zulus were trying to achieve and their actual physical experience of battle. I mean, there's some pretty gripping uh, and grim accounts of the Zulus breaking into the camp and finishing off the remaining white soldiers. And they're, they're pulling no punches in their descriptions of what they do. And the Zulu people after, are they annexed? Are they subjects for Majesty Queen? Or are they, is, it, is it a sort of uh, a client state set up? It's complicated. What they initially try and do is not annex Zululand, but they break it up into, into separate chieftainships, one of which they allow Chichwayo, who's originally taken captive and sent down to Cape Town, he even visits Britain at one point and meets Queen Victoria. But Chichwayo goes back and, and takes control of one of these chieftainships. And 
this is never going to end well. And of course, they start fighting each other because they've really been set up by the British to do that. And eventually, after a few years of, of, of more bloodshed, the whole thing is taken over by the British. So ultimately, it's annexed. That was not the original intention. But of course, they have to do it, I suppose, in the end, just to keep the peace. So, David, thank you very much indeed. The book is Zulu. People are still buying it. How many years ago did you write it? 2004. So uh, we get, we're not far off. Well, it's 90, coming up to 20 years. Now. You wrote it as a student. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Welcome to the History Hit YouTube channel, which we are relaunching. We've got all the best exclusive content going straight onto this History Hit YouTube channel. And you can find out, for example, why on earth I'm standing at the top of this mast. You should probably subscribe.